Now, if you are new to HubSpot and Salesforce and how they integrate, there is a native integration for HubSpot and Salesforce that you can get on the HubSpot marketplace. It is managed on the HubSpot side, but it does create a managed package in Salesforce along with a custom permission set, custom fields, um, and different visual force components to be able to access HubSpot data from Salesforce. But if you do have the integration installed, um, the installation process starts in HubSpot and actually managing it on the day to day starts in HubSpot. If you're in a company that hasn't integrated it and you're wondering like, why would I, what's the benefit? Being able to connect your sales and marketing data and actually like use that together and have it um, in a like automatic, like immediate <laughs> like resource for HubSpot is very valuable. Um, especially the, the, the most common use case is let's say we have forms hosted on HubSpot landing pages. Someone submits a form and a lead is automatically created in Salesforce for your team to follow up with. And then as that lead is being worked, data that's updated in Salesforce is synced back to HubSpot for your marketing team to act on or report on. So that is why you would integrate HubSpot and Salesforce. It is an easy install process, but the reason that my company exists is because there are a lot of gotchas and nuances. So if you are going to integrate it, definitely look at the resources I shared or reach out. I'm happy to help. Now, um, one thing that I would love for y'all to do is drop in the chat if you are more HubSpot leaning or Salesforce leaning as far as your background. So are you a Salesforce admin looking to learn more about HubSpot or are you a HubSpot admin looking to learn about Salesforce? Like which side of that are you most on just for our reference? And also if you want to throw on, if you're using the HubSpot Salesforce integration, if you want to add that in there just for my reference of do you use this or not? It looks like we have a lot of HubSpot and some Salesforce. So that's awesome. Cool. There's a lot of people who started with Salesforce that are now in HubSpot. So excited to share about this. I'm working on a course on this content, this topic. So feel free to ask questions and share ideas of what you want to learn about this. Um, we're going to try to keep on top of the Q&A and chat as we go through. <laughs> it's just the two of us, so we'll see. Um, and then at the end, we'll definitely have time for conversations. I don't have slides. I'm just going to be clicking through the platforms. So I'll talk through what I think is important. Um, and then at the end, we can, of course, dive into uh, more things, more demos, stuff like that. So first, going to dive into, I'm going to close this when I'm getting notifications. <laughs> I'm going to dive into Salesforce. So if you are in Salesforce and you're used to being a Salesforce admin, you're very familiar with this panel. This is the setup section in Salesforce. So in Salesforce, there's normally two sections. There's the front end, like user facing, where you're actually working with records and data. And there's the back end, which is set up. So in Salesforce, you have um, different Lightning apps, and these are essentially how your system is set up. So a lot of times when people are talking about the user interface being very customizable in Salesforce versus HubSpot, they're talking about Lightning apps. So in Salesforce, you can customize how your objects appear, up here at the top, like leads, accounts, contacts, et cetera. Um, and you can switch Lightning apps to show different layouts. So different custom objects showing at the top, different reports. Um, there's just like different like houses for your data in Salesforce. Whereas in HubSpot, it's pretty set. It's pretty set. This is how your browser looks. This is how the top banner looks and your access is controlled, but it's like the actual UI can't be customized like this. So if they're talking about like custom UI, they're talking about lightning apps. So again, setup is kind of the admin center of Salesforce, except like the dev console and stuff like that, but primarily setup, which is comparable to settings in HubSpot, which you can access by clicking settings up here. A difference with setup and settings in between the two is every HubSpot user has access to settings. It's just which settings they actually have access to because preferences and individual user things are also controlled under settings, not just all of the admin stuff. So all of your users will see settings. It's just limited to what they can actually do once they get there. Um, so any questions around like that or, um, yeah. or the admin panel? Cool. Okay. So as you're an admin, <laughs> basic, that's where you start. Um, something else we want to talk about is different objects. So, this is a big conversation as far as Salesforce objects versus HubSpot objects. And what I want to encourage everyone to think about is not everything in Salesforce and HubSpot are apples to apples one to one. The different systems are designed to work differently. They have different like features and like strong 
or strengths, weaknesses. So whenever you're looking at it one-to-one, -one, you can get there for the core data, but we're talking about like extraneous data or more like custom objects. It's not always going to be one-to-one -one or sync perfectly. Um, so think about this as just more background information. So if you're trying to figure out which objects you're using in Salesforce and how they connect, you would go to schema, schema, not sure, builder in Salesforce under setup, which allows you to check all of the different objects that exist in your Salesforce account and see how they connect. Um, this can be super overwhelming if you select all of them <laughs> um, <laughs> because of how many there are. And a lot of people wonder why are there so many objects in Salesforce versus HubSpot? Like, what is the big difference? There must be something missing. A big reason that there are a lot more like admin facing objects in Salesforce is because of something called a junction object. So in HubSpot, you might be used to seeing maybe like a deal that's associated to a contact record where it has a deal on the side and it can show a company's probably a better example. There's a company and you can see if it's the primary or if you have a different association label, that association label in Salesforce lives on its own object. So you would have a company, a contact, and then an account contact relationship in Salesforce. And those are three separate objects. The benefit of that is you can have actual properties connecting those two objects of being able to say like, custom data of if you had like an insurance broker or like a real estate agent, you could have different information connecting like on that connection. Whereas in HubSpot, that's not an individual object, it's an association label. And so when you're trying to sync those associations from Salesforce to HubSpot or recreate them, that can be confusing because that junction object isn't really something that's visible in Salesforce, it's just on the back end, uh, but it doesn't pull that data through because it is actually an object in itself, not just an association. That might be like <laughs> way too many words altogether, but <laughs> just like some baseline of why there are more objects in Salesforce. Um, there's more capabilities in, in certain aspects of just what these apps are in here, but a big reason is that junction object that doesn't exist in HubSpot um, natively. So the answer to schema builder in HubSpot is the data model management tool. What I like about this compared to the Salesforce one is it doesn't have all of the lines until you hover over one. <laughs> so in Salesforce, as you see, if we select all of them, like remember you can saw all of those lines. Um, and if we auto lay out, it'll probably take a while, but it'll pull them out like that. Whereas in sales or in HubSpot, it waits till you hover, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and it has the same functionality of being able to check what you want to see and what you don't want to see as far as custom objects and how they connect. So this is a little more user-friendly and that's kind of the general theme of HubSpot versus Salesforce is HubSpot has an easier to use UI and easier to like comprehend, look at, take in. Um, and that pretty much translates to everything HubSpot does versus Salesforce where it's more um, of like a developer view um, when you're looking at things from the back end. Um, okay. Now, switching gears, I want to talk about how users are managed in Salesforce versus HubSpot and how visibility is managed. So this is a big topic. <laughs> um, so in Salesforce, when you create a new user, you assign them a license, usually a full Salesforce license, so they have access to stuff in Salesforce. You assign them a profile, which is their base level of capabilities in Salesforce, what they're able to do, like create contacts, create reports, et cetera. And then you enhance their capabilities with permission sets. So if they have like a sales profile, you could also give them a permission set for like sales management to be able to, I don't know, create dashboards instead of just reports. And then if you want to control what they can see, you would use a role. So profiles and permission sets are what you can do as a user and a role is what you can see. So the way that roles are usually managed are like CEO, sales leadership, sales people, and then like sales admins, maybe, maybe those would be reversed, but it essentially gives you a tiered system of access to data. And so that role hierarchy controls what records you have visibility to, whereas the profile and permission set is what you can do with the records that you can see. In HubSpot, this is controlled through permission sets and teams. So whenever you create a user in HubSpot, you assign them a seat with the new model that just came out. You assign them a permission set and you can assign them a team. So if you create a user, you would choose a seat. Let's choose a core seat. 
Um, and once you have that, that has this permission sets that are here, um, you can create the user. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and once you create them, you can assign a permission set um, or go to create a permission set, which is a really similar process to Salesforce. It's just, again, an easier to navigate UI um, because creating a permission set in Salesforce um, essentially gives you the same function of what we're doing in HubSpot, where it is um, like access to all of the capabilities in Salesforce and you have to go through and check them individually. Like if we wanted to do something for contacts, we'd go to object settings and contacts and change permission sets here. Whereas in HubSpot, if we want to do something with contacts, we would do it here. Um, the benefit of the Salesforce way is it's more granular. So if I wanted to say for this permission set, I want access to everything in contacts except for like this one field, I can do that with a permission set, which means it takes more work to build those, but you have more granular control, whereas the HubSpot ones are continue to evolve more in that direction. But the, the like level of control is still um, contacts you own, teams own are all contacts when it comes to these different um, capabilities. I do believe that there's field level permissions on enterprise now though. Yeah, you're muted, but I think yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Which is controlled at the field level though, not at the permission set level. Correct. Okay. Um, I think we're gonna get to that a little bit later. Yep, yeah. okay. So Salesforce is roles, profile, permission sets, um, and licenses and HubSpot is seats, permission sets, teams for the most part. Um, and in Salesforce, you can create profiles that are like custom for your organization. Like there's the default, but you could also create like North American sales if that's a specific profile. You can create presets in HubSpot that are comparable or you can create a preset set of permissions for when you create a new user to assign those to them. Um, Okay. We, actually, we have a question that's kind of relevant. So yeah. what does the seat part of a user setup in HubSpot assign and what's the rough equivalent in Salesforce? So the seat part of a user, this is part of HubSpot's new model that came out, I think last month. Um, so a core seat gives you access to do stuff in HubSpot, um, pretty much marketing hub. And then, and also feel free to correct me on this because we're all still learning this together. Um, and then the sales and service hub and the individual hub seats allow you to do that specific like paid set of resources. So if you have sales hub, you would assign a sales hub level seat. And then that gives them all the core access as well as the sales access. The comparable like equivalent in Salesforce is licenses. So you would use a full Salesforce license and you would use a core seat or a specific seat in HubSpot. Yeah. Um, on the, I think there was an, a question about like licenses for custom objects. Um, licenses has nothing to do with custom objects. The custom objects are controlled by your um, uh, account level with HubSpot, which would now be like your enterprise seat, I believe. But you still have access to custom objects if they're in your account, but you would need to have at least like one enterprise user that creates those custom objects is my current understanding with this new model, um, giving us the grace of it's new. Um, okay, continuing down the line, um, page layouts and record customization. So we were talking about the customization of the UI. Something else that people, uh, Salesforce users are really a fan of is the ability to do page layouts in Salesforce. So what a page layout is, is let's say, let me open up a contact. What a page layout is, is how certain data is organized on a page. So with different page layouts, you can use the Lightning App Builder to control the different modules that show up here. And then within the details section, the page layout controls which fields are there, as well as which components are there. You can see our HubSpot embeds are here, and we have different fields. A benefit of page layouts in Salesforce is the ability to create different sections and have different fields that are showing up for different users. Um, with the page layouts, you can create multiple and assign them based off of um, the user profiles. So if you wanted your system admins to have one profile for contacts, you can do that. If you want your uh, salespeople to have one profile, it essentially will allow you to have access to different levels of data, different pieces of data, right? So you can control it by profile and by record type. This is helpful with opportunities in Salesforce or deals in HubSpot, where in Salesforce, you would be able to have a different um, set of fields for each record type. 
Um, let's say you have new business versus a renewal or an add-on, you might need to collect different levels of data. And so with page layouts, you can change that like depth of data um, to like make it more accessible and easy to use for your teams. In HubSpot, you're able to achieve a similar effect using record customization. Again, this does not give you the capability of the Lightning App Builder, which is the ability to change the entire page. And just to like give you more concept of what that is, um, if you click Edit Page, it's going to open the Lightning App Builder. And this is where you can actually change the pieces on the page, which is this is the piece that HubSpot does not have. So being able to add separate sections and modules, this doesn't exist, but control within the framework that HubSpot has does exist. And that's where record customization comes into play. With record customization, you can customize the left sidebar, the middle column, and the right sidebar, which is pretty much all of it, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you can also customize association cards as far as how your records are associating and what's showing. Um, what's beneficial of this is that you can customize it by team as well. So you have the default that's for everyone, and you can create an individual team view. So if we wanted to say, um, this is assigned to just our sales team, then we can have the about the contact section and we could also add a section for um, like specifically sales data. Um, and so here you could take deal information and choose whatever about the deals that you would wanna add. And then there it's kind of like a page layout, but it's for that specific section of the page. The reason I like this over Salesforce page layouts is it's easier to edit when they're all in one face and jumping back and forth. And there might be like a default set of data that you would want for that middle and right side. But what you really need is that quick access data on the left side of Salesforce or an HubSpot, which is kind of like that preview data in Salesforce where the top of the record, it can sometimes have those like core four fields in a um, quick layout. It'll have on the left side so you can easily access like email address, sales data, opt out, whatever. Um, whereas for an admin, you might be looking at uh, data hygiene checks or last refresh date, created date, last edited by that type of data. Whereas as a salesperson, you wouldn't want that. So being able to record, like, customize records in setup is very helpful. And you do this under data management objects and you can do it on any of the objects like deals. You can do the same thing where you customize it. Um, this solves for that um, team visibility where it's assigned to certain profiles. What it doesn't solve is that um, record type visibility, but what you can do is create a section that is conditional, meaning this section will only exist if the deal stage is presentation scheduled. And so if we had... Um, uh, once this deal hits a certain stage, we need to collect these properties. You could have a rotating section here where each stage it's in has these properties. So maybe we need a link to the presentation. Maybe we need um, a list of people who are coming, whatever you need to collect for that stage. You could have a conditional property that only shows up on the deal when it's in that stage. Um, similarly, you could base it on pipeline, which pipeline in HubSpot is equivalent to record type in Salesforce. So if the pipeline is the default pipeline, then we show these properties um, and you can select multiple instead of just one, which is nice. <laughs> um, but this is how you would control if we wanted different data for our default pipeline versus renewal or add-ons, that same functionality you have with record types, this is how you would get that um, with record customization. Are there any questions around this that popped up? Uh, no, no. Okay, cool. yeah. Awesome. I'm excited to dig into all of these at the end because there's so many popping up. Um, I'm avoiding them so I don't get distracted. Um, okay, next let's talk about reporting briefly. Um, reporting is such a rabbit hole, so this could take a long time, but what I want to talk about is just like high level functionality. So in Salesforce, your primary reporting tool is dashboards. You can create dashboards as a home page, you can have them as standalone, you can subscribe to them. Um, HubSpot has dashboards as well, but the way that you build them are a little bit different. So in Salesforce, all five of these little widgets here could be the same report, but visualized differently. So what that means when we go to edit a dashboard is we can add a widget. Let's say we want to add a chart and table for this one. And then once it's in here to add this report, you can change the visibility here 
of this data um, and do that six times. So you can go and create different filters of this report and different visualizations of this report and only use one report to create a whole dashboard. It just shows it in different visualizations. Whereas in HubSpot, when you add a report to a dashboard, you are adding an individual report that is already formatted in that way. So if we add a report for deal volume by source, the report itself, this is a demo account. So the actual reports are pretty light as far as actual data. Hold on, let's see if we have anything in here. Yeah, Jared, that works. So this report is a number report. It has the singular number. I could also make this a donut or a pie, whatever. But whatever this report is, as the report exists in HubSpot, this is what it is in the dashboard. So if you want 20 different visualizations of a filter of data in HubSpot, you would create 20 reports and add those to the same dashboard. And so where that matters is report limits of how many reports you can create in your account. Um, where it also matters is some people get annoyed that they have to like clone it and then save it with a different visualization to then add it to a dashboard. It's not a huge problem, but from an admin perspective, that makes a big difference if you're used to building reports in one system versus the other. Um, I like to do this to be able to create these different visuals because sales reps, it's nice to be able to see like the meter, the number, and then the list. Um, so yeah, that's high level view dashboards in HubSpot versus Salesforce from an admin view. Um, and something else that people often get um, confused about when it comes to reports is lists versus reports. In Salesforce, this is a list. What a list is in Salesforce is essentially um, the view that you would have going to an object itself where you can see all of the different categories. You can create different filters, different list views that are accessible here. And if you have the permissions, you can also do inline editing where you can edit the name right here. Um, you could edit the close date, whatever. So if I'm a sales rep, I might be working through this list and I know, okay, this is now going to close a few days later, whatever, and make changes directly here in this list view. In HubSpot, what we're used to seeing if you're an admin and you're asked to create a list, what you would create looks like this, which is a list in HubSpot that's based off of certain criteria. So if you're in Salesforce and you're used to seeing as a Salesforce user, okay, I want to see a list of my opportunities, you're used to seeing this. And then your HubSpot rep creates one that looks like this or your HubSpot admin. And you're like, well, I can't edit this. This isn't the same. This doesn't work as well. And that's because you're not used to seeing a list that's more of a marketing or reporting focused view. This is like a HubSpot list on a Salesforce list. What's the most comparable in HubSpot to a Salesforce list is a view. So what views are in HubSpot is under each object, a view is a pre-saved list of filters. So if you think about the functionality of clicking down here into these different views, um, it's the same as clicking through these different views <laughs> of what my contacts are, my recently assigned, et cetera. And it doesn't have, you can do inline editing. Um, so you can click through and save just like you can in Salesforce. What I like about HubSpot that doesn't exist in Salesforce is the ability to click it and click edit and search for any property that's available on that object and change it right here. So I could update their height <laughs> right here. Um, even though it's not a property that's on the inline editing, it's something that's accessible, right? Whereas here, if I click into it, there's no capability to do that. I can just select multiple in order to change something that's not on this list. I would have to click into it, find that field and then edit it. So. HubSpot can be more user-friendly if we're educating that lists in Salesforce are equivalent to views in HubSpot. Um, the last thing I'm going to go over is object validation rules in Salesforce and property validation in HubSpot. And then I'm going to get to the questions and the chat. So Perfect. feel free to add stuff in there. Okay. So validation rules. This is something that a lot of Salesforce admins are like, well, in HubSpot, I can't control enough. I can't lock it down enough. Um, and I can't trust my sales team to do anything. So I can't use HubSpot because I don't have enough control. That's a big argument I hear a lot. And there's some merit in that. Um, the counter argument to that is if you have an easier to adopt and use, and use tool, oftentimes you don't have to lock it down as much because your sales team can be trained and it's easier to use. There's different like ways to enforce that. But that being said, <laughs> in Salesforce, you are able to create something called a validation rule for an object. In HubSpot, you're able to create validation rules for properties. Um, what a property is in HubSpot is equivalent to a field in Salesforce. So it's one data piece attached to a record on an object. In 
Salesforce validation rules can be created through formulas um, <clears throat> or uh, yeah, formulas. So you essentially would create a actual formula that says if this, then that show an error message, show where it's going to appear. So you have a lot of control. Um, one example that I have here is first name is required. So if they try to save a record and the first name property is blank, it'll show an error message that says first name is required at the top of the page. They can't save it. Um, you can do pretty complex things with validation rules. So you could say if like lead status is working and we don't have um, a value for this property and the value in this property is not X, then show a message. You can get really granular with the um, level of data that's required and the if then statements for dependent data in Salesforce. Um, and also the details of the message and the error location is nice. In HubSpot, if you're going to do property validation, you would do it on the actual property itself rather than a code on the object as a whole. The way that you do that is when you're actually creating a new property, there's different validation options based off of the property type. And you can see this here, um, you can require a unique value. Like if you're gonna have an external ID for a record, um, a minimum character limit, a maximum character limit, um, restrict to numeric values. So controlling the type of data and not allowing special characters. So you're able to control this from more of a data quality perspective, more so than a, if this, then that, then this um, kind of like matrix, like you can with Salesforce validation rules. Um, do you know of anything that I'm missing around validation that you might be able to do in HubSpot to have that similar capability? Out of the box on the property, I think that's pretty standard. Okay, cool. I know that validation is kind of new, but also the reason that I asked this clarification is HubSpot's product team is like wild <laughs> and that they could have released like five more things this morning and I wouldn't know about them yet. So it's always nice to check with another admin to be like, hey, like, have you heard of this? I'll add my own disclaimer to that. Same. It happens to me too. So if anyone knows of anything different, like feel free to let us know. For sure. Um, it's all, we're all a team here. Um, the only other thing that I know is conditional property logic that has been something else. Um, that's somewhat similar, gets you a little bit closer. So if we say the buying role is equal to budget holder, we can add a dependent property and say, if that's filled out, we need an account name um, and we need this also filled up. So we can say, if we do have a property, then we do need this other data and that'll stop them from saving it. Um, so it's not written in a formula, it's more point and click. So what you lose here is we can say if buying role is equal to budget holder, but what we're not getting here is buying role is equal to budget holder and stage is X. So that multiple requirement is missing here, but this is getting you a lot closer to being able to require because a base need, if you really think about it, is usually like if the deal stage is working, we need to know X, Y, and Z. So that's usually where validation comes into play. So most of the use cases people use validation rules can now be solved for with HubSpot. But if you've got like lines and lines of formulas in your validation rules, HubSpot's probably not there yet. So the next steps are, do I need this? Um, answer that question. And two, like if so, then um, how could I solve for it otherwise? Yeah, and in okay. true admin style, the chat is offering some options on ways to work around that and get it a little closer to what you're looking for. So, Yep, record create, you can require forms for sure. Um, the problem with that is usually whenever you're using validation rules, it's at a certain point, not just the start, it's like halfway through. But yes, you can definitely do that. Mandatory fields between deal stages for sure. Um, being able to control that under, where is that? Is it pipeline rules? Yep. You can control your deal things there, deal stages, pipeline rules, all of that. Okay, I'm gonna start working through these. <laughs> um, how do you wanna manage questions? Love it, yeah. So if everyone could go in and just make sure that you've upvoted any of the questions that you've put in or are there are any that you are looking to have answered, um, I will give you just a few seconds to do that. And then I will just kind of run down the line for you, Lauren, and then you can focus on answering them and yeah. We can work it that way. All right, let's hit it. Okay, how can HubSpot leverage Salesforce relational data such as opportunities, upline items, or orders, an order product to do complex segmentation? How can Salesforce leverage HubSpot data? How can HubSpot leverage Salesforce relational data? 
Got it. So it depends. Um, our favorite answer. So the challenge with relational data in Salesforce is that junction object, um, especially when it comes to like, let's say products specifically in Salesforce products are structured using um, price books. So if you're going to have a product on a quote or a quote line item or something like that, you're going to need a product and a price book in order to do that. Whereas in HubSpot, your products and your price are controlled on one thing. Like you said, the product is the price. If you have different pricing, you would create different versions of that product. And so like product right now does not sync through to HubSpot directly in the native integration um, because of this, because you need to have a price book entry and a product to actually get a price in HubSpot. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. Um, my best advice for the integration as far as getting data into HubSpot is figuring out that go on like a use case based methodology. So if I as a marketer need to segment to people who have ordered X product, um, find a way to get like that one data point instead of saying, I want to build my Salesforce data model in HubSpot. That's usually not the way to go <laughs> because every additional field, additional object, et cetera, map is an additional point of potential failure when it comes to the mappings for the integration. So if you wanted to get like order, order product data, figure out what you need from that. Um, like let's say if you have, you want to just figure out if this contact has this product, you could always create a field on the contact in Salesforce that then pulls data from an order product through a flow, sets that property and syncs it to HubSpot. Usually that's a cleaner um, way to go from a marketing perspective in HubSpot than actually syncing the custom objects and building that um, filter in HubSpot. So it really depends on the use case and like what you're actually going to do with that data once you have it. That makes sense. Uh, let's see. Uh, attribution in Salesforce is easier due to the ability to assign leads context to different campaigns. Uh, what is the way to do this in HubSpot? Um, in HubSpot, you're able to add lists to campaigns. Um, so I actually did a training session recently on um, campaigns as far as like comparing them. I'm going to drop this link in the chat as well as far as just different trainings I've done on the topic. All the recordings of these exist in the Navigators community. So the link I dropped earlier, you'd have to join. But if you're interested in what I've actually done. So that being said, campaigns in Salesforce are focused on sales and sales activities. So I add this contact because I'm actually selling them in this campaign or this trade show, whatever it is. And it's focused on sales outcomes. HubSpot campaigns are focused on marketing activities towards a specific goal um, and marketing assets align with that goal. So how many people engage with this landing page, this email, this form, whatever, and your ability to add all of those assets is where HubSpot really thrives. And so I encourage people to use them differently for different things rather than trying to make them a one-to-one -one matchup. Um, with that being said, you can create custom objects in HubSpot for campaign and campaign member from Salesforce and sync those through with the connections. Um, usually it's not worth it, but you can do that. <laughs> um, but the one thing that you can do with HubSpot campaigns that's kind of comparable to that is you can associate static lists as an asset. So if you have all of the marketing assets, you can add an asset, which is a static list. And so if you wanted to add a list of contacts to a HubSpot campaign, you can create a list in HubSpot and just add them, um, which will incorporate them in your different um, reporting that you get from that campaign. Awesome. All right. If you have multi-account enabled in Salesforce, how would you best transpose this relationship into HubSpot? Is this through the integration or migrating to HubSpot? <laughs> uh, Nicola, that was your question. If you want to add a little context to that, that'd be great. Um, the answers would be different. So multi-account through the native integration, you're not going to be able to do that very well when it comes to syncing. The main way that I would do that is um, the associations itself won't pass through. Um, but a quick plug for my friends over at Happily, they've created an app called Associate, which is like a lifesaver when it comes to this integration, <laughs> um, to be able to say, like, here's this ID from Salesforce, find the matching account and build an association. Um, so with that, like coming over, I would use Associate to then recreate those account relationships. Um, however, that's definitely a custom solution. And there would be like kind of a lot that goes behind that. So I wouldn't say that that's like an easy solution, but when you're using those multi-account relationships, there probably isn't an easy one. The way you are doing that is through a junction object in Salesforce. So one thing you can do is create that junction object in HubSpot as a custom object and sync it as well. 
um, that might be the best way to go. And then you can look at that custom object using associate to then build those associations to the companies in HubSpot. So there's a few ways, but it's not like a simple, oh, this is the clear answer. <laughs> um, but I'd love to talk to you about it if it's something you're trying to work. Awesome. All right. I just refreshed to make sure that nothing popped up. Um, what is the usual strategy to integrate Salesforce custom objects to HubSpot? And you just kind of just talked about some of that, but if you want to dive any deeper into that. Yeah. Um, again, everything with integration, I'm going to say like least as possible, like little as possible. When it comes to fields and standard objects, I always recommend integrate as little as possible and don't try to make it an exact copy of your data. So when it comes to custom objects, um, make sure there's a strong use case for actually having that data in HubSpot. Make sure that HubSpot record limits fits the custom object. I've had some people who have like millions and millions of custom object records and they can't all get in HubSpot. So if you don't have all of them, you shouldn't have any of them <laughs> because it's not helpful. Um, but have a strong use case. So campaign members, there can be a really strong use case for that in HubSpot. As Nicholas shared, it's been a game changer for them. Some people it is, some people it isn't. Um, but figure out why you need that data in HubSpot. Like if you think about it from a a dev request or you're trying to get a request into a sprint, create that business use case for yourself when you're adding something to the integration. Um, say I need to send an email to these type of people with this data from custom objects, like subscriptions would be a good one as far as like custom object data to pull into HubSpot. Um, and then once you figure it out, just create the custom object in HubSpot and pull in as few fields as possible. So once you've created um, a business case for the actual object, create a business case for each of the fields as well. Um, because fun fact, if one field in a record is not syncing between HubSpot and Salesforce, the whole record's not syncing. So you really want to be mindful whenever you're syncing fields to not sync stuff that doesn't matter. Our first step on any project is to do a field audit. And we usually end up deleting like 40 to 50% of the fields you have in HubSpot, um, especially from the integration itself, because you're just not using them. Um, and then once you do that, you can easily sync custom objects. Okay, that's great because I think the next question ties into a little bit. So in HubSpot Salesforce, integration is is the only way to limit data that syncs from Salesforce to HubSpot, similar to the list. Um, is selective sync reducing Salesforce permissions the only way to limit that syncing data to HubSpot from Salesforce? Yes. Um, so there's two methods of preventing data from syncing. An inclusion list controls what syncs from HubSpot to Salesforce and what stays in sync. Selective sync controls what comes from Salesforce to HubSpot. Um, if you are using an inclusion list, which is an active list in HubSpot that basically says, if they're a member of this, they meet this criteria, they can sync. Um, and you're syncing something from Salesforce that you don't want to sync, it will create in HubSpot, but it won't stay in sync. So if you want data to not come to HubSpot in the first place, selective sync, limiting profile and permission sets are the only way to do that because and also roles like a big thing there is that visibility because if you remember we talked about profile and permission set is what you can do and roles is what you can see and so if you want to prevent data from coming from salesforce you have to change your organizational wide sharing settings to private and add visibility and capabilities to all your users and the integration user to hide certain things um because the only way that hubspot won't take in that data is if they can't see it Makes sense. Can Salesforce notes and comments on an object be synced over to HubSpot? I want to see if Salesforce users spoke to a contact, has an update on a deal, et cetera. Um, I believe so. So if you're talking about like a contact, if you're talking about a standard object that's synced, yes. So you manage that under the integration settings under activities um, and you can sync um, the individual activity types as far as like note created, it can sync through from HubSpot to Salesforce and back um this is from hubspot to salesforce but if you enable this sync it's syncing like right here you can see that a salesforce task is created it syncs through and if a note is on the timeline i believe it syncs through as well um but you can the, with the beta that just came out if yours doesn't look like this the reason is there's a new beta when it comes to um activity sync and you can get that under product updates um search salesforce and then you can see new stuff about bi-directional task syncing <laughs> Awesome. Uh, Salesforce has both leads and contacts. How do you map both into HubSpot? Yeah. Um, zooming way back for one second. So leads and contacts in Salesforce sync to HubSpot contacts. Salesforce opportunities sync to HubSpot deals. Salesforce accounts sync to HubSpot companies. Um, Salesforce activities like notes, tasks, all of that sync to HubSpot activities or events. Um, 
I think that's all the big ones. Um, contacts and leads in Salesforce will both sync to the same contact object in HubSpot. Where that can become an issue, um, I also did a training on this. It's like, they're like 45 minutes. They're more deep dives. <laughs> but um, leads and contacts in Salesforce can have the same email address. That cannot happen in HubSpot. In HubSpot, you cannot create duplicates with the same email address. So a problem that people run into is if they create their Salesforce duplicate and matching rules in Salesforce to allow for duplicates, like let's say you have a customer and you want a new lead record created every time they submit a form or something like that, the HubSpot integration is not a good fit if that's going to be your strategy because whatever record in Salesforce is most recently updated with the email that matches the HubSpot record is what's going to sync to HubSpot. So it'll sync and overwrite your data on that contact. If you have a new lead with like no data that just came in, it can go and overwrite the data you had that's syncing to a contact. Um, what I typically recommend is to use a contact and a deal or contact and opportunity model with Salesforce to use opportunities for your leads um, instead of the lead object independently. Um, and it's set up more like the lead object is in HubSpot um, because the lead object in HubSpot does not sync with the lead object in Salesforce. They're very different um, functionalities. Long-winded answer, but they both think talks about contacts. Makes sense. Um, let's see. How did uh, we have two business units in HubSpot, but Salesforce holds only one? How do we handle this integration? Um, if you're not syncing stuff from one business unit to Salesforce, I would just not put it on the inclusion list to so make an inclusion list requirement that only this business unit is allowed to go to Salesforce. Awesome. Okay. Um, this was one I copied over. How does someone complete a user analysis within Salesforce? Um, would love more details on that one. So as far as um, a user analysis, um, I'm assuming that you would be saying like looking at the users and what their capabilities are. Yeah. What I've done in the past is filter to all active users because sometimes it shows like everyone in your Salesforce account that's kind of irrelevant. Um, what I like to do is pull all active users into a spreadsheet and create different tabs. So there are usually a lot of profiles and permission sets in an account. I like to start at the user level. Um, because if you have a bunch of inactive users that have different profiles and permission sets that nobody active has, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, so I would create a tab for users, a tab for profiles, and a tab for permission sets. And then looking at the key capabilities across those. So this could take you a year. It could take you a week. It just depends how in-depth you want to go with that. Um, but I like to look at like contact, create, edit, delete. I try to simplify it down to what HubSpot allows you to do because... You can get more granular if you need to, but it's a good place to start. And then in the spreadsheet, you can create like lookups from record to record as far as like what you need to do. But that's my basic advice is to create a spreadsheet with user profile permission set um, to see what people have. And then you usually give that spreadsheet to your decision maker or your client or whoever it is to say, this is what your people can do <laughs> at a high level. Like they can create, read, edit, whatever. And your user can say, okay, this is way too complicated. We have too many of these. We need two profiles. This is usually what it comes down to. Is so like we can greatly simplify this <laughs> two to four or something like that. Um, and then you can take your users and kind of work backwards there to put them into the new sections. But good old fashioned spreadsheet is how I would do that. Nothing wrong with a good old fashioned spreadsheet. <laughs> I dropped the survey for today's uh, event in the chat. If you guys wouldn't take, mind, take a moment and go ahead and fill that out. If you have any comments or questions that we're not uh, able to get to, you can add those there and I will make sure Lauren gets those as well as the feedback. Um, I'm gonna take a couple more questions and then we will all get on with our day. Let's see. Um, with some of the data security privacy, privacy issues that arise in Salesforce, is Salesforce planning on releasing some sort of protocols to stop HubSpot agencies from purchasing data on the black market and using the integration to bootstrap that data into a Salesforce account via an import? That's a little fortune telly. Um, I'm not quite sure you can answer that, Lauren, but if there's anything that you have that touches on privacy uh, issues that show up in the Salesforce planning, you're absolutely welcome to answer that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, HubSpot has very strict privacy agreements that wouldn't allow you to do that today in HubSpot. Um, if you're using purchase or scrape lists in HubSpot, your account can be suspended, canceled, all that. And it does happen. I've dealt with a lot of people that are in that situation. As far as not allowing integrations to pull stuff in, I have no idea how they would do that as of right now because it's just a basic API integration. Um, so I guess no comment is my official approach to that question. I don't know. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Do you have a list to any best practices to troubleshoot sync errors between the two platforms? I mean, I know we could sit here and dive into all kinds of them now, but it, 
I'm sure you have a resource somewhere. Yeah, the certification has a whole module based off of that. Um, module seven, if you go through the course, has video resources on this as well as a cheat sheet. And the community that I was talking about um, also has a knowledge base that's like, here's how to solve each of these sync errors. So would highly recommend um, both of those resources. Awesome. Which again, um, they're mine. So sorry for the plug. That's okay. <laughs> resource, a good resource is a good resource. <laughs> Um, let's see, I'm trying to skip the ones that were similar, uh, tips for managing duplicate company records in HubSpot when Salesforce integration is installed, uh, we're unable to merge company records in HubSpot. Mm -hmm. Um, huge issue always will be my best solution is through associate. Um, I'm going to, I did a training session on this as well. Um, and also this blog article is helpful. Uh, I'm going to drop this in the chat as well. Um, essentially you would use, honestly, this is step-by-step step what I would do, um, filter your companies for not having a Salesforce account ID. What happens in HubSpot is it creates duplicate accounts that then sync companies to that based off of the domain name. So there's some cleanup in Salesforce you can do. There's some automation in HubSpot you can do, but look at that article because it literally is point and click instructions. Awesome. I'll get another one on duplicates. I'm trying to get at least one more in here. That's a broad enough topic. Uh, another association is there a solution for duplicate companies we just talked about that mm -hmm. um we have a new sales director who has exclusively used salesforce and we have hubspot for sales and marketing what are the main reasons that she should adopt hubspot rather than buying salesforce for the sales team what would be some advantages of having both yeah advantages of having both let's focus on that so outreach and sales loft are often platforms people use with salesforce and that would be like a sales team's preference whereas like hubspot is a marketer's preference so outreach and sales loft both enable you to do sequences and different templated things as a salesperson um, that then syncs through to salesforce my recommendation is sales hub because it connects your data in one spot what Salesforce is really strong as is a CRM is a CRM, being able to store data, have complex like relational database that has all of this data connected, where Salesforce is not a strong tool is sales enablement. So if you think about the people who are actually working and closing deals, making quotes, Salesforce is great. If you think about the BDR, the SDR that's trying to find leads, source them, get those first calls, actually book them and get them into your pipeline, Salesforce is not great for those people. Um, I actually have a video in our course that's like a deep dive on this, <laughs> um, like 20 minutes about this specifically. Um, but what HubSpot has is sequences, meeting links. It's got the ability to automatically enroll people in a sequence based off of a workflow. Using HubSpot for sales and marketing, especially that sales enablement piece, even if you're using Salesforce as your CRM, it gives you a connected sales and marketing experience from a customer perspective. It's really not from the user. If you're thinking about your customer and the buying experience they expect, using the HubSpot sales enablement tools combined with the HubSpot marketing intelligence creates like an unbeatable <laughs> sales approach to be able to connect with people and um, market and sell effectively, especially at the top of funnel. Um, but if they are a hardcore Salesforce person, it will be a hard sell. <laughs> um, and in the video in the course, I talk about actual numbers as to HubSpot to Salesforce compared to all the sales enablement add-ons you need in Salesforce to get the sales hub features. That's been successful when you're talking to sales leadership that have a budget to own. To say if you really want it, it's going to cost you like a stupid amount compared to what sales hub could. Good luck to you. Thanks, Cindy. All right, I'm going to end the questions there just so that we don't run over into everyone's time. But if there are any that didn't get answered, I will make sure that those get shared over with Lauren and then you guys can engage on Sprocketeer, on the HubSpot community, anywhere that, you're, that you are. Lauren, you said LinkedIn is the easiest for you. Yeah, feel free to leave, reach out on LinkedIn. I am behind on my DMs right now. So expect a day or two for me to get back to you, but come find me. Um, awesome. We'd love to chat. <laughs> love it. I appreciate it. Um, and I know I've mentioned this before everyone joined. I do bleed a little orange. It is okay. <laughs> the systems work together. It's it's quite all right to, to love them both. Um, I appreciate it, Lauren. Thank you guys for joining us. And don't forget, we have the networking event on Monday. So if you want to come chat with your fellow Sprocketeers, I will see you on Monday. And if not, we'll see the rest of you on Tuesday. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Bye.